Tonight on Romatsky, a Ukrainian MP attacked after anti-corruption inquiry with Victoria Vaitsitska, an MP from Samopomich. Eastern Europe's LGBT community under rising pressure with Anna Ilyaridze, Artyom Zavadovsky, Vard Margaryan, Svetlana Zakharova, and Volodymyr Naomenko. And finally, Sweden promises more support to Ukraine with Andreas von Beckerath, Sweden's ambassador to Ukraine, tonight on Romadsky. Hey there, my name is Maxim Ristavi. You're watching the Sunday show, Romadsky's only primetime show explaining Eastern Europe in English. And I'm Josh Kavensky, a reporter with the Kiev Post. Tonight we're going to sit down with Victoria Vaitsitska, a lawmaker who was attacked during the week. We're going to talk a bit with the uh, Swedish ambassador to Ukraine about Europe's stance on Ukrainian politics and the Minsk agreements. And finally, we're going to have an extensive in-depth segment on, on ongoing attacks on uh, the LGBT community in Ukraine and Eastern Europe at large. Well, it was a very heated week in Ukraine, but uh, stay tuned with everything that is happening. Go uh, um, to our podcast page and download audio podcast, uh, the show in, uh, as a whole, and all uh, interviews, interesting interviews separately. Uh, just go to a mix cloud and type Hromatske. Also go to our website. Uh, all extended interviews that are featured during the Sunday show are going to be there right after the show. You can uh, browse through all the materials, our explainers on the whole region, e Eastern Europe and Ukraine. And um, I encourage also to download our app uh, at uh, iTunes App Store. Uh, go there, type Hromatska International, and yeah, here you go. You can download it and stay up to the date on all our content. Well, all right, uh, we're going to be back in a second. This week saw an attack on Samopomich lawmaker Victoria Vaitsitska. Um, what happened was is some group of attackers went to her home and covered the car right outside of her house, right outside of her bedroom window, and right outside of her house in um, flammable material, causing an explosion. The flames reached up, to, up to two or three floors up to her bedroom window. Um, as of now, it's not known what exactly motivated the attack, but we do in fact know that she has been speaking out for a long time about corruption in the energy industry. We know that she's been speaking out about um, corruption in other areas, and she's been more vocal about it than others and more proactive. She's given, I think, up to four cases to Nabu. Yeah, and she yeah. filed anti-corruption inquiry uh, regarding um, state energy monopoly, and this is the most, the biggest case of corruption inside uh, Ukrainian and state monopolies uh, tied to the energy sector. This is the cluster of the biggest corruption in the country. That's why uh, it's not just uh, she has uh, I, you know, assumed troubles because of that, because other journalists were threatened, right. because exposing uh, this energy sector corruption and this uh, union between oligarchs and uh, state-run companies. And the energy sector in particular is interesting because it's not just internal Ukraine corruption. I mean, we've seen Russia be able to kind of control Ukraine through corrupt deals in the energy sector under Yanukovych with Firtash. It's historically been a, uh, a thing that's happened you know, for quite a long time. And although I want to reiterate that uh, investigators and not the investigators nor Vaitsitska have yet established, you know, what exactly, motivated the, what exactly motivated the attack, a lot of the suspicion has been on uh, her activism regarding the corruption sector. Um, so I think, you know, I went to her, ta her uh, house today or earlier today in uh, the Kiev suburb of uh, Kazlin. And I got to talk to her and sit down with Victoria uh, and discuss, you know, what exactly happened and uh, what she thinks about the attack. On Thursday morning, four o'clock in the morning, four, five, four, ten, I don't remember exactly. I woke up from um, a distinctive uh, sound, like <laughs> smash. And I looked at the window of our bedroom where we sleep with uh, our three-month-old son and my husband, and I saw a fire going all the way up to our second floor and um, just um, ran out of, uh, ran down the stairs and uh, went uh, outside, and I saw a fire going on uh, the car, the 
place nearby and the big uh, bush was burning as well. So that, that's what I saw. And uh, from what I understand from the comments that I got from the um, security service is that, well, it takes uh, three to maximum five minutes to burn a car and flames would go all the way to the second floor. So most probably the house would be on fire. And uh, again, what we've uh, discovered that there was a uh, three liters um, um, of volume bottles thrown at a, at my car, filled with some explosive uh, liquids, and uh, splashes were also on on the house, on the uh, bush, and uh, the the uh, the area around the car. As far as I understood, they've come from either from the other side of the river, because we have a river over here. Again, from what I understood uh, so far, is that this attack was well planned. Uh, it's not that easy to find the place. You probably notice it for yourself with uh, finding this place. It's, it's a challenge, first of all. Second of all, we have uh, to get from that neighboring area, you really need to understand how to get here. It's not like a plain field. Uh, so that was supposed to be planned as well. They didn't get to uh, attention of any cameras around. We don't have, but our neighbors have. So they've planned it as well uh, to not being caught uh, on cameras. And um, um, therefore, it's not necessarily related to the latest things that I've been working on, issues, challenges. It might be related to something that I've started working on um, earlier, some uh, corruption schemes that I'm trying to uh, uncover, and uh, it can be anything. Well, let's uh, let's be absolutely clear. We're talking about industry size of 300 billion grivnas. I mean, it's the biggest one in Ukraine. And it's always been a source of cash for enrichment of a uh, few. And uh, most of our oligarchs became oligarchs thanks to access to um, assets and resources in the energy sector. So I've specifically targeted a couple of issues, starting with Ukrnafta, uh, getting back the control over this company that uh, already paid 2.5 billion uh, grievances of dividends last year, thanks to the bill that uh, I, together with my colleagues, uh, um, lobbied and we managed to get it passed in the parliament. Uh, there was uh, an issue with, uh, or a big a story about transformers of Grigorishin that we managed, together with my colleagues, again stopped from being uh, um, implemented and um, the results that there are savings of three times for the state right now versus the original price that was indicated in the offer. We analyzed the raw issues that are of a greater urgency versus those that are of lesser urgency, including the issue with uh, 10 billion greenness of taxes that are due by Ukraine after we're pushing for uh, both the uh, fiscal services, prime minister, the the head or the general director of the company to sort it out and uh, to focus not on restructuring the debt, but actually uh, recovering it from the companies that are uh, intermediaries and uh, those that belong to private uh, conglomerate. That was just a... Um, a sarcastic uh, comment made a year ago that I could lose a hand in the head uh, fighting with oligarchs. It was right at the middle of the um, of this uh, uh, story of getting back the control over Ukrnafta and Ukrtransnafta, also state-owned company. <laughs>
Europe's support for Ukraine into doubt. And yet, one focus point of this has been the Minsk agreements. We've seen repeated violations, ceasefire violations of the Minsk agreements um, from Russian-supported separatists in Donbass. We've also seen a failure of the RADA to pass key legislation that would grant uh, increased self-determination to the breakaway areas. So we at Hermatsky got to sit down with the Swedish ambassador to Ukraine earlier this week and hear his opinion on the ongoing debate over Ukraine's political crisis and the status of the Minsk agreements. How would you estimate the implementation of Minsk agreements? Because uh, I have an impression that we are moving towards a situation where nobody really believes in that, in this agreement anymore. Yeah, I, I mean, a few starting points when it comes to the Swedish view. The, the first important starting point is that we believe that there is one aggressor and there is one victim. The aggressor is Russia, the victim is, is Ukraine. Um, secondly, we believe that if Russia would like to sort of end this conflict, stop this conflict, they could do that in a matter of days, if not hours. They could simply stop um, uh, pouring in weapons, soldiers into Ukraine. They could stop their propaganda. They started this conflict and they were able to end the conflict as well. Thirdly, I understand if people have you know, opinions on the Minsk agreement. It's not a perfect agreement. But peace agreements never are perfect agreements because they're part of a compromise. And I think it's important to, to realize that the Minsk agreement is what we say in diplomatic lingo, the only game in town. It's the only roadmap we have towards sort of ending the conflict. So we really hope that the Minsk agreement, the implementation of the Minsk agreement will be more successful uh, in, the, in the weeks and, and months that will come. And we realize that it is difficult for Ukraine to implement its part uh, when Russia is not doing enough on their part when it comes to implementing the ceasefire. There are quite a lot of ceasefire violations at the moment. Another example where Russia is lacking political will is providing access for international observers. But still, it's important that Ukraine shows willingness to implement its part because Ukraine cannot afford to lose what we call the blame game if the Minsk agreement would fail. But you mean its part, it's what do you mean? It's constitutional reform, it's, election I mean, it's, Yeah, it's, it's, it's what, it, what, what is pointed out in, in the Minsk agreement. It's the local elections, it's, it's the, the, the constitutional changes. Again, I realize that it's, it's, it's challenging for Ukraine to do it at this moment when their ceasefire is not respected. But I, I, I think it's important that Ukraine shows that it's willing to do it. How uh, We know that the Minsk process is a part of the Normandy process mm. and it's led from the European side from, from, uh, by France and Germany, yeah. not by the EU. Yeah. How you as Sweden, how other countries of the EU like Poland or I don't know, mm. others can influence this process? while they are a little bit out of the game. I mean, you're right. The Minsk, Minsk format is, 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 uh, is made up by, by France, Ukraine, uh, Russia, and, 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 and Ukraine. Um, and, and Germany. And Germany, for, of course. And the EU is not, as an entity, part of the, the, the Minsk or the Normandy format. But, of course, we have regular discussions in Brussels and between the EU states. So we're able also to, to present our views when it comes to the implementation of the Minsk agreement. And mind you that the, the, the sanctions against Russia, which are a key factor in this whole game, uh, they will not be lifted until Russia has implemented its part, its part of the Minsk agreement. So in that way, the EU has an important role to play also when it comes to the implementation of the Minsk but agreement. Is there arguments like that, you know, look, Ukraine is also falling short of implementing its part, mm. no constitutional reform, and therefore let's leave sanctions and forget about it? That is the risk that Ukraine cannot allow itself to take. That's what I mean. That's why it's so important that Ukraine does not lose the so-called blame game. Ukraine has to show that it's willing to implement its part. From Swedish perspective, we see no reason whatsoever to, 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 to change the, the sanctions. We do not believe that Russia has done nearly enough uh, to motivate such a discussion. 
But in order, do you think the pressure is growing for lifting sanctions? Well, I think in order for that pressure not to grow, it's important for Ukraine to do to its part. Um, and when it comes to the EU and the, the different opinions within the EU, for a long time there's been discussions, you know, that the EU is not unified. But still, I mean, if someone would tell me two years ago that the EU would impose strong sanctions against Russia, I would have said that that's probably not possible. But we were able to, un to unite uh, around strong sanctions against Russia. But again, let me stress that in order not to risk sort of that discussion to surface about whether or not to prolong the sanctions against Russia, it's incredibly important that Ukraine shows willingness to implement that part. So that was Andreas von Beckerath, uh, Sweden's ambassador to Ukraine. We, uh, during the interview, we were showing pictures from Eastern Ukraine, and it's important to uh, remember that there is an increasing pressure on ceasefire in Eastern Ukraine. The shellings keep happening almost on an everyday basis. Unfortunately, uh, casualties keep happening on the everyday basis. The, the war is going on. It's unfortunate because, I mean, it really just doesn't get that much coverage in the Western media that, you, that it really used to, and it seems like the world's largely forgotten about it. It's true, but the point of the ambassador, it, it was um, e interesting and important at this moment because there are so many people in, in Europe and even back in the States who want to tie the uh, ceasefire process to Ukrainian reforms and they keep saying that if Ukraine doesn't reform itself enough, uh, probably it will lose support when it comes to a ceasefire process and sanctions against Russia, which is in fact the greatest debate right now, whether we should tie Ukrainian reforms to this process right. or to international violation of international law. And I mean, while it was encouraging the Swedish ambassador said that Sweden would pretty much under no circumstance, at least currently, give up uh, the sanctions regime on Russia. It's also interesting to look at other countries, you know, Italy, Germany, and see the pressure internally from business interests on um, lightening or removing the sanctions. You know, and it's not, you know, oftentimes it's not necessarily in the foreign policy interests of the countries, it's just in the business interests of people who want to make deals with Russia. Exactly, and although a lot of people still uh, keep, uh, keep their doubts about the connection between Syria, Russian uh, military campaign in Syria, and Russian military campaign in Eastern Ukraine, at the same time, Russia Russia pulled out of uh, Syria, and now a lot of speculations whether or not it will translate into a greater warfare in Eastern Ukraine. We'll uh, keep our eye on the situation, and uh, let's move on, and we will be right back in a second. Well, Ukrainian image uh, uh, went under increasing pressure, international pressure, and the heated debate inside uh, Ukraine was provoked by violence in, in Western Ukraine, in Lviv. Attempted um, festival of equality organized by LGBT activists got canceled just hours. It, it started, uh, organizers defined uh, the court ban that was backed by local authorities um, you know, preventing the festival from happening or any public disp uh, display of, uh, of festival activity. Uh, local authorities uh, kept saying that they want it, um, they want to ban all those activities because of security concerns. Well, uh, you know, obviously we will try to explain right now briefly what happened, what kind of reactions we got after this really, really frustrating and uh, intense uh, a day in Lviv in Western uh, Ukraine. Um, I, I'll need the help of Josh here, just, you know, just because of being, uh, um, you know, uh, LGBT advocate. I will try to uh, absolutely be professional, but I, I need your help here right. explaining what happened. And let's just start with a quote of... Uh, of uh, Lviv Mayor Andriy Sadovi, um, who said that uh, yesterday's events in Lviv are an outcome of a well-planned operation. Participants from both sides willingly or unwillingly played the role for staged visuals. I condemn the violence, but as the head of the local self-governing body, I have limited powers over law enforcement agencies. The court ban of public rallies by both sides at the Opera House was right. So it's interesting. I mean, you can see the quote, he's blaming both sides. He's not just blaming the aggressors who were attacking the peaceful protest. He's also blaming the protesters and calling it a kind of Soviet-style provocation. It was uh, the, biggest, uh, the biggest expectation because uh, Lviv mayor kept silence for a long time. Yeah. Uh, he uh, wasn't absent publicly during the most heated uh, times of the court hearing and then the next day during uh, violence that uh, was unfortunately seen on the streets of Lviv. 
And uh, with his statement, a lot of people were pissed off because uh, he actually blamed the both sides and kind of took the side of the Lviv City Hall, which was um, the move of the City Hall was a huge surprise by a lot of people because Lviv is considered more liberal, closer to European right. border. And the City Hall did not act really in, in, in line with the protesters at all. If anything, they took the side of the, uh, well, the people who were actually the provocators, the uh, people who, who assaulted the protesters. Uh, that was concern of organizers. And for example, one of the biggest concerns of, uh, expressed by Ukraine's uh, representative for human rights at the parliament, Valeria Lutkovska, and she released uh, a call for the Lviv mayor saying that the state must guarantee the effective exercise of the right to peaceful assembly, not only in cases when people are exercising their right to express views that the majority hold to be conventional, but also in cases when those viewers are unpopular and may shock or disturb the public. It was a great, uh, it was a yeah. very unprecedented move because uh, even two years ago, it was very hard to find so many people expressing uh, their support for LGBT activists. And we saw that, you know, at least on the level of national government of Ukraine, we saw other promising signs. For example, the uh, Ukrainian foreign minister, Pavlo Klimkin, said uh, in a tweet that tolerance and non-discrimination make Ukraine stronger. I condemn the attack on LGBTI activists in Lviv. The police are investigating the case. So we well, at least... Unfortunately, that was the only reaction from the Ukrainian government. Not a single uh, Ukrainian top politician or government right. uh, representative expressed any any reaction to what happened, but there was a very powerful and you know, massive reaction from foreign embassies in Ukraine. American, Swedish, Canadian ambassadors came in support. Uh, here's a tweet of Roman Vashuk, uh, he's a Canadian ambassador. He said, like, a strong state should have a monopoly on violence. This also applies to dealing with thugs, threatening LGBT events. Obviously, uh, he cites the inability of um, local authorities and the police to prevent the violence or even arrest people on the streets because not a single arrest, arrest was made. And we did see in the RADA, the Euro optimists did also come out with a statement uh, supporting the uh, protesters and condemning the violence, saying that you know the police, is, the police, the passivity of the police and the city government of Lviv caused the failure of the Equality Festival. So those are also some strong welcomed words, I think. Yeah, and uh, the, the last quote we want to uh, show you, it's from Kharkiv Human Rights Group. Uh, it's a, one of the most respected human rights groups in Ukraine. And they said that they demand um, an investigation into the police role in this debacle, and they want a probe into the behavior of the Lviv city authorities and the police. Um, they, they think that the, both authorities and police didn't uh, manage to protect the constitutional rights of Ukrainians to, for a peaceful assembly. Um, I think it's worth, uh, it's worth to show uh, one viral video that went viral uh, to, uh, yesterday showing exactly the moment when uh, far-right protesters attacked buses with the uh, police buses with LGBT people inside that were leaving the, the venue of the uh, LGBT festival. So basically, if you want to understand the scope of the problem, the scope of debate inside Ukraine, so one side says that it wasn't right to uh, push limits of the local community and to organize an LGBTI or equality event in a city that is conservative and uh, absolutely you know, not very comfortable with the idea of having gay people in the city um, right. doing anything like that. But the other side says, well, it's not about uh, gay people, it's about constitutional rights and access to the constitutional rights of peaceful assembly. And also, I mean, people, you know, people aren't children. I mean, it's possible to see something you disagree with in the street and not immediately react with violence. 
I mean, just because you disagree with somebody's lifestyle or what they're saying doesn't mean you're automatically provoked into just attacking them. I think that's something people forget. Well, we had uh, this week a very unique interview uh, right. at Hromatsky where I actually gathered inside one studio uh, LGBT activists from all around Eastern Europe. This, is, this was the first TV group TV interview, I think, in history where uh, um, anyone managed to do that. And we talked a lot about regional um, differences between different LGBT fights in the whole region. But the surprising part was that almost everybody of, uh, in, uh, from present uh, LGBT activists agreed that the countries are so different. But when it comes to homophobia and LGBT fight for civil equal equality and civil rights, almost all countries share the same uh, problems. Let's take a look and uh, listen to this interview. I'm going to start uh, with uh, asking questions about your own countries, but, you know, in kind of regional perspective. And I think i um, start with Svetlana. I'm talking about Russia as the, uh, the biggest country in re region as a bigger troublemaker, because we know that basically all our problems inside smaller countries um, kind of started out uh, with this anti-gay uh, propaganda law in Russia and Russian attempts to push it as foreign policy. I talked to you over a year ago, and we talked about ri rising violence in Ukraine comparing to Russia. And then you said to me, uh, and it's, by the way, uh, following ILGA Europe index that Russia went up a couple of uh, positions. You said that the situation got a bit even better after the war in Ukraine uh, started. Is it still the trend? Well, I would say that it's really complicated because on the one hand, we have really more people who support us. And on the other hand, we have uh, a lot of troubles, uh, problems with legislation. We have this so-called propaganda law, we have this foreign agent law and all these things. And of course, the level of homophobia and level of violence is increasing constantly. And... Uh, um Vladimir, um, talking about um, Ukraine, obviously rising violence in Ukraine, but in a couple of recent days with really a uh, unique kind of conference, for example, happening in Kiev where activists from the whole region and Europe gathered together, they're all kind of confused about the message with Ukraine. On the one hand, you have historic legislation passing anti-discrimination law. On the same time, you have rising violence against gay people on unprecedented levels. And today we saw this poll, a uh, new poll releasing saying that over 68% of Ukrainians still um, have negative views towards gay people. And in some cases, you know, the statistics even got worse in the recent two days. Mm -hmm. So do you have also kind of mixed feelings of what is happening? Uh, yes, it it's, uh, look like the very um, strange mix of... Uh uh, from one hand, uh, yes, we really have uh, s some small uh, um, improvements in our legislation, but they are very small and very decorative, and it's the problem that uh, actually uh, there is still no laws that protect people f against uh, pr from violence. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, and now uh, the, our government's making everything just to uh, make. Um, and uh, v visibility of reforming this field with uh, anti-discrimination because this uh, small uh, amendment to labor code, mm -hmm. which is prohibited uh, discrimination uh, uh, toward LGBT people, it's the only the small drop in the sea uh, mm -hmm. of, of problem that's facing LGBT people in Ukraine. And uh, together with rising uh, uh, right movements in Ukraine, we uh, we see this in increasing of the uh, violence against LGBT and this uh, uh, talks uh, of politics that uh, uh, blaming LGBT for the problem inside Ukraine. I want to address the Georgia issue because, for example, for Moldova and Ukraine, they are going through a similar um, process of uh, integrating into a trade space. And it was for many LGBT groups and for all queer people kind of a sign that maybe because of that, we can overcome larger homophobia because we can say like, well, you have to do that in a way to uh, push for greater economic rights, and then we will discuss the issue. But then what is happening that now now, Georgian government, after getting visa-free regime with yes, is pushing a referendum 
uh, that could ban same-sex marriages in a country. Don't, don't you feel kind of that it, the whole process was political theatrics in a way to get this regime and without the government caring about the, the issue at all? Okay, I'll just make a small uh, correction. Yeah. So it's not about banning same-sex marriages because we it's not allowed. Mm -hmm. Just because Georgian language is not gendered in and out itself mm -hmm. in the constitution we have no specific um, gender um, dimension of marriage so now they want to impose that gender dimension mm -hmm. and make marriage as a unity of men and women mm -hmm. so that's the case um, they started to talk about it like pre it's, it's kind of a pre-election campaign but it's it can take serious dimensions because gender and sexuality issues are always very kind of a good tool to play with before elections mm -hmm. uh, because it's kind of connected to uh, sentiments and to, um, I don't know, nationalism that is always kind of rampant in Georgia. So, uh, but the thing is that we are not even given the visa free movement now. We are still on the performing mode we have to perform for Europe mm -hmm. and we have to be good so it's kind of an ambivalent situation what's going now and it's really kind of hilarious what everybody who is speaking in this room I can say yes that is happening in Georgia as well so we are going mm -hmm. the same processes um, so maybe kind of um, taking advantage of being in, in, in the same situation mm -hmm. can save some experience or yeah but what do you all think about it? Because all these countries you represent here, they are absolutely dramatically now different, but they have this common Soviet background. And I think that's fascinating that homophobia and homophobic attitudes unite all those countries despite uh, difference in economies and history and so on and so on. But how do you make sure that we're not following the same path like in Central Europe, right? They pushed for greater uh, civil rights equality uh, because of European integration. And then when European integration happened, m most forces started rolling back those civil liberties because the general population still doesn't get the, the concept of equality. How do we not make the same mistake in Eastern Europe? What do you think? Can I come and just yeah. like to continue? Uh, I think it's kind of a double phase of globalization and what, what is happening now, not only in our region, but like globalization unites uh, countries with the same values, but also pushes nationalism and homophobia as a something really, um, as something that can underline your identity in mm -hmm. this globalizing world. So I think Russia is, um, is using that really well and European countries must, may, must be more concerned and attentive to all these nationalistic tendencies in the countries. To make it That one. are sometimes encouraged even. Um, yeah. I yeah. think the difference between us and the Central European countries is that they haven't been affected by the Russian or Soviet influence as much as we are. Mm -hmm. And we're still present in this media space, in the cultural space, linguistic space. And um, there are a lot of people in Moldova, for example, who do not speak the state language, which is Romanian, and they watch Russian TV channel. And this is the pure propaganda that is brainwashing their minds. And it's so hard to detach from, the, uh, from uh, this uh, flow of information. For example, it happened in Ukraine when the Euromaidan started, but nothing similar has happened in Moldova. Mm -hmm. And people are so pro-Russian, a lot of people, and the mentality and the background is so similar and appealing to them that we also have anti-Ukrainian sentiments in the country, though we're neighbors, mm -hmm. and it's really uh, Well, we're all talking, and I'm extremely privileged sitting here in company of, you know, one of the bravest people in our region, just because you're um, brave enough to speak out and, you know, to share your views, but also your identity. And that's the biggest problem with the region, because in Russia or Ukraine or Armenia, Georgia, Moldova, with hundreds of millions of people in the population, there are still a handful of people who are opening the gate. And, you know, basically because of security concerns. But we're talking so much about personal, uh, personal uh, leadership and then how it's important to lead by an example. It's not happening at the moment on the needed, uh, needed speed. How do you find, I mean, 
isn't it even frustrating personally for you that you're still in you know a in lone voice a lone voice yes despite being open the whole countries are in, in the, the closet. closet and even our uh, other queer people who are not activists cannot join us I actually don't think that in Russia situation is so bad because uh, what really makes me happy is that so many new people come into and they join the movement and we had this forum for LGBT activists last uh, year and there were 150 people and I was really happy that I didn't know at least half of these people. So I think that all this pressure makes people come out actually because they don't want to take it anymore. It's also a matter of the size of the population in the country. Mm -hmm. Russia is big, Ukraine is big, there are more activists. But population-wise, we're like literally few people in the country who are out and proud and marching and fighting for, for the rights of everyone in the country. And we have very little support from the community because we're a very uh, agricultural, rural country. And you can imagine uh, what it means to be uh, openly gay in, the, in such a small country uh, where affected by the uh, political and economic crisis. Well, we're facing very different, mm. you know, a region with different problems, but it, it is changing dramatically. As we speak right now, there is a, a dismantling of a really huge landing monument happening in Zaporizhia in southern Ukraine. And, you know, even two years ago, it wasn't very uh, even possible to imagine that. Or uh, last year, during the opposition march in, uh, uh, in Russia, uh, we saw so many LGBT uh, flags there, which was mm. also amazing. So I hope that we're, we're in very frustrating point, but in the beginning of real changes. Thank you so much for joining us. It was really enlightening moment. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as with other interviews, you can uh, watch the full interview, um, this interview or any other interview you're seeing right now uh, during our show at our website. And you can actually uh, go to our website, the address of the website, just right here uh, uh, near my head on your screen. And uh, um, it was very enlightening conversation, you know, because yeah. again, I, I talked about that during the interview. I've would never imagine sitting in Kiev with so many LGBT activists from all around the country sharing experiences just because even like two years, three years ago, it was dangerous even to be here for them. So it's great that they were able to come. And you know, there's an interesting thing that happened over the weekend where um, most, a, a number of the major ambassador, foreign ambassadors to Ukraine came out with announcements condemning the violence in Lviv. But the uh, one that didn't was also the one who the same day as the violence gave a uh, pretty big interview to BuzzFeed that I think we can put up on screen um, in which she talked about being, and this was the British ambassador to Ukraine, Judith Gao, she talked about being um, an openly gay ambassador in a country that largely is against uh, gay rights. Well, it's important because she is the first British ambassador uh, who talks about being openly gay uh, that has never happened before, I, I, partially because it's not a priority for a British Foreign Office anymore, which is you know, a great thing. But then uh, she would talk about that she doesn't want to be defined. And she, she served in Georgia, for example, before right. Ukraine. And she was open there, right? Yeah, she that, was open yeah. there, an extremely homophobic country. But she uh, keeps saying that she doesn't want to uh, be in, uh, defined as a gay ambassador. She wants to be an ambassador and mother and uh, happens to be uh, a gay woman. But at the same time, when you serve in homophobic countries, it's very easy to become a kind of a one-dimensional character just For because sure. of your sexual identity, not because of your achievements as a professional. It's all very powerful, but I think uh, that's now we're going to leave you for a couple seconds. Uh, and Yeah. Well, Ukraine's biggest remaining Lenin monument was dismantled this week in Zaporizhia in southern uh, Ukraine. And it's it, your hometown. Yeah, it's, it's my hometown. Yeah, so it was your, your hometown, very, Lenin. It was very weird uh, yeah. to see that because usually in the recent two uh, kind of years, we got uh, used to these violent footages of dismantling Lenin's all around Ukraine, sometimes illegally, but you know, right now with the anti-communist law, which is very strict and prohibiting any uh, public display of Lenin or other communist leaders, 
it it would still be violent. But in you in in Zaporizhia, it was, uh, in my opinion, very defining moment for the country because it was done in very civilized and absolutely uh, peaceful manner with uh, workers. Uh, they've been working on the, the process for days. It was clearly very, very well organized. And in fact, it took so long to take it down that people were complaining because they just wanted to see Lenin gone. But I remember oh. the video stream went on for like 48 hours before they could actually get rid of, <laughs> get, get rid of Lenin. Yeah. It was even a bit uh, <laughs> kind of challenging to keep a track of it. But to be honest, yeah. not everybody w would be happy about the, the the, the process. For sure. But that being said, after 90 years of tyranny, what's uh, 48 hours? Um, but you know, before, after after we bid you farewell, we're going to show you a um, short clip of London finally going down in Zaporozhye. My name is Josh Kavensky. I'm a reporter at the Kiev Post. Uh, I want to thank you for watching tonight. I want to encourage you, if you want to stay in touch with uh, up-to-date news in Ukrainian politics, you can read the Kiev Post. Uh, you can find us online. And if you want to uh, stay in touch with Ukrainian politics and events all across Eastern Europe, then you should uh, watch Hermatsky. But thank you. My name is Maxim Ristavi. I do encourage you to go out to the website and uh, keep tracking it during the week and watching all the full interviews there. Uh, for now, it, it, that, is, that is it. We were going to leave you with Lenin. And we will see you next week here uh, at Studios in Kiev with the Sunday Show. Thanks for watching and have a great week.